I'm Dave Mowitz, and welcome to Successful Farming. On today's program, I'm tracking the sale of late model John Deere 460s to get a feel for what round balers are worth these days. And then I feature another great farm hack. We feature a rare International Harvester 7488. You know, we used to call them anteaters. And after these brief messages, I traveled to Northern Illinois to tour a shop edition, which provided a family a much needed office. So please stay tuned. Do you recall when we featured the Baker Farm Shop several years ago on Top Shop Tours? You know, if not, go to Successful Farming's YouTube channel and search for Baker Shop. Anyway, at that time, Mark and Kim Baker were contemplating an office addition to their Orangeville, Illinois shop. Now, as innovative as their shop was, I knew that whatever office they were going to build was going to be a winner. So when Mark told me the office was done, well, we had to return to their farm to see the results of their design efforts. So Mark, when we left this shop, it's been about three years ago, I was standing out the back door going, this is gonna be an office, but I had no idea this was gonna be an office. What a neat facility you added on here. What you did is you designed an office that fit your operation, and yours is just not a typical operation though. Like I say, you have corn and soybeans. Correct. You have a few animals here. A couple. Yeah, yeah. you're in dairy. We're, we're dairy, yep, that right. is correct. And then this year, uh, well, for the last three years, we've been, uh, two years, we've been actively growing hemp. Hemp, right. For Which CBD is so, oil. So you have a farm operation with dairy, you have a retail operation with precision planting gear, and then you have this new venture of a new crop. So let's take a step back how did you settle on size? Because you weren't sure three years ago what size you were gonna go with. Yeah, I was really kind of determined by the structure that was actually laid down on the, on the original uh, shop. Oh, okay. And so uh, the one service door and uh, uh, to, the, to the west, if you will, right. and we realized that that's all the wider we could go on the office. So deep, how deep we could go, uh, determined on our county regulations and our township and how close we could be to the road. Oh. And so I, I took it right to the inch and uh, that's where we came up with that measurements then, so. Your shop sits this direction. You put the office off to the side. Was that a hard thing to marry it into the, the existing structure or you found a contractor that just said, okay, we can do that? Yeah, I, what I did is I ended up going back to the contractor to build our, our shop. Right. And uh, um, we had them build the shell for this office. Oh. And so when they got done, it was just a, a shell, no insulation, no wiring or anything. Um, I had a buddy that, uh, he's a full-time fireman, so on his off days, uh, I asked him if he'd give me a hand. So you, you dressed it out inside. We then. did the whole, I mean, as far as the wiring and everything, everything you see, that's, that was our design and our build. Yeah. The bakers opted for in-floor heat to make sure neither family, staff, or the numerous visitors that come to their office ever have to suffer from cold feet. Now, heating and cooling wise, you didn't actually put the vents in the walls yeah. or in the floor. Yep. You went with the uh, open pipe then. Yeah. And you just liked the look of that? It, it was more of an industrial look. Again, we wanted to, you know, we wanted to give this office a, a, a taste, a different look, and, and, and I feel we did. You know, we, it was another one of them struggles, well, how are we gonna do this? And then I finally said, you know, I wanna do this and I think it's gonna look great. Yeah. And so we went with that. Um, truly, that's really all that's for is the, uh, for the uh, AC, uh, central air. Right. And we did in-floor heat on this office. Kim and Mark made use of a wide variety of old farmstead materials to adorn their office, ranging from corroded sheet metal to aged barn boards, as well as aged barn doors. What makes this such a comfortable facility, too, is just the other nice touches. Barn board for the windows. You used old barn rail for the doors going into the conference room here. The doors slide on yeah. the old 
barn door rails, yeah. which you actually took out of a, what, 1880s barn? 1889, and it says on the other side of the door, it's really faded, it's hard to see, but uh, yeah. every, every, every piece of lumber in here has a story where we got it, how we got it, yeah. you know, and uh, it's, it, the whole thing has a story. I mean, uh, you know, the track that's in the ceiling with the chandelier, as I call it. The hay track uh, that yeah, you have over right yes. here. And, yeah. You know, these are things that, you know, people look at it, and some people don't even understand what this is and never seen it, and then when we can tell them the story, and that's really what I wanted to do. I wanted to preserve a little bit of what our history is, who we, who we are and where we came from. The Baker operation includes sons, Chad and Zach, as well as a growing staff to cover their different businesses. The Bakers opted to go with an open office design to accommodate their growing staff and for future growth. Before, I bet when people came in here before even the shop was up, they probably went, always went to the house. Yeah, yeah. It's... Now they know to go here. Yeah, I mean, we, I don't know if we trained everybody or not, but even people that have never been here before it just seem to gravitate and they know to come right to the shop and they see the office and they know it's, you know. And I think what's inviting too, and I mean, it makes it look, I mean, like this has got to be the door. You know, we, we didn't do a traditional door on the shop. But we have a, a, I guess you want to call it a professional glass door, like a storefront. Oh, yeah. And so people automatically are gravitated to that because they see it and they go, oh, this must be the door. It is the first time I've seen a shop office use a glass door like that yeah. it is like a retail outlet yeah. or a space isn't yeah. it for that yeah. reason and it's the big problem we had was the door that we originally got put on with the building by the time we were done with construction i could see so much wear on it that it wasn't going to last and i said this isn't going to work so i went to our uh, glass company uh, north of here in monroe and and uh, talked to the owner and he yeah. said yeah i can hook you up I'll, I'll get you a door they're not cheap but they're nice this was an investment and it's not like we're making a whole lot of money these days on the commodity prices the way they are. So you were staring at a, you know, an investment to make. Uh, was it that hard to justify the cost to your banker, or is he just a really understanding guy? He's a, he's a very understanding guy. Um, I'm sure you'll never watch this program because he's so busy working, but we, we keep him in the dark the best we can. <laughs> <laughs> now he's gonna watch. I'll make sure he gets it. Yeah. No, he he actually. Um, we were looking at the cost factor of it, and there was a discussion. Instead of being thirty deep, um, what if we do twenty five? And he absolutely. I mean, he said, I, I, "I will not let you do it if you cut down that five feet." Really? Yeah. No, that's that crucial. And yeah. and I I'd agree with him one hundred percent because my son and I were sitting down looking at it, and he was we were doing it per cost basis, and he was like, "What if we just knock five feet off, and we can, you know, it looks a little better?" And I'm like, "No, no. Nobody's ever built anything. Nobody's built a shop. Nobody's built anything in their lives on a farm and said that was the biggest and the best because I don't need anything better than that." And you always wish. You had another 10 feet. You've had this now for what a uh, year, two years. This would be two. This would be our second season. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you do differently? I don't know. You know, that's a. It's always a good question to ask somebody. What would you do different? And I. I mean, I. I wish we could have been bigger, but we were. We were kind of in a. In a a yeah. spot that we couldn't, so the size was exactly what we had to do. The spot as far as the yeah. location. As far as the, right. the location, we couldn't gone any bigger. Uh, I'd be honest with you, uh, Dave, I don't know if there's anything I would change. I, I'm seriously that pleased. Right. And my wife jokes about it, and she always says that, uh, you know, I built this room or this whole office almost better than what our house is. You know? <laughs> but we spend a lot of time up here, and we really do. Yeah. Boy, have we come a long way in farming from when corn was planted individually and farmers repaired equipment under a shade tree or bought seed or tools around the kitchen table. Today, planting is high speed and precise. Top shops keep equipment rolling at peak performance and farm offices like the one that the bakers added have become crucial to conducting business. I'll see you again next time on another Top Shop Tour. Join me at auction to see what John Deere round balers are worth, and then I feature another great farm hack. So please stay tuned.
If you've been considering upgrading your round baler that has gotten long in the tooth and short on its tines, then this 460R may be just the ticket. Now this is the first of John Deere's new baler line when it was introduced in 2018, and it features the mega-wide feed system. Other enhancements include an operator's monitor and Deere's exclusive Diamond Tough Triple Wee belt. Now I expect bidding on this particular 460R to be brisk at a consignment sale being held by Cook Auction. However, it's turned out 2,600 bales. It's a lot of bales for its age. Now, the reason you want to know about baler production is that it has an impact on pricing. And speaking of prices, I'm going to go track down Scott Cook at Cook Auction, ask him what the trends are on late model round balers these days. We're talking with Scott Cook at Cook Auction. We're looking at that 460R baler. That's just a 2018, but it has 2,600 bales. So it must have been a commercial hay producer selling that? Uh, I would guess so. We don't know that for sure. Right. Uh, but anytime you roll up 2,700 rolls in one year, obviously they've been using it a lot. One thing I know concerns farmers, and that was when we got into the premium balers and the compatibility of the monitor and the tractor or the ability for the baler to talk to the tractor, what we call it called the isobus. You were telling me guys were shying away from premium balers, deer premium balers, because they wouldn't plug and play with the tractor very well. And there's a workaround to that. Yeah, so here at our place, we had tried several premium balers, John Deere's premium baler, and we were, it was a lot easier for us to sell the standard baler because I think there was a concern about having the proper monitor. Right. And so we almost quit buying them because we couldn't get anybody to buy a premium baler. But what I, I, I'm afraid some of the farmers, it's possible that you didn't know that you could just buy a 2600 John Deere monitor or or a, a updated monitor go right in your older style tractor and it's the exact same baler other than you just have to use a monitor and it's right now we're on uh, baler prices are strong and they're asking price and they're gonna be th through the winter you thought uh, uh -huh. because we've had good hay crops this year there wasn't a lot of drought anywhere it seemed like except for spots here and there as there always is so you're going to expect to pay a little more than what you were looking at maybe a couple years ago then. I would agree with that totally. Thanks for the information, Scott. Let's watch the Deer 460 sell. Boy, was, that's an 18 model or 17 model baler, I believe. 2,800 rolls. 29.5, 18 model, 30,000. 29.5 Well, the final price on our Deer Baylor settled out at 29500 Now, how does that bid compare to the sale of similar Baylors? I recently completed a review of late model baler values for Successful Farming Magazine. I discovered dealer asking prices on 2018 460s ranging from $31,000 up to $53,000. Now, I'm going to throw that $53,000 baler out because it was a nearly new demonstrator model. Calculating those other balers, we come up with an average $39,900. But if you're looking to dial in on dealer asking values on balers, I highly recommend you cash in on free appraisal tool being offered by Iron Solutions. You can get two free appraisals a month by going to agriculture.com slash what's it worth. I conducted a search of balers similar to the one we featured today on Iron Solutions and found a total value average of 37,673. Pretty accurate today's final bid. One last observation before I go. There are a wide variety of additional features that a baler can possess that will greatly influence its resale value. For more information about Cook Auction, please go to their website at cookauctionco.com. I'm off to cover another sale. See you next week in another Steel Deals Report. Have you ever improvised a repair, fashioned a homemade tool, or created a shop get by or make do? Then you'll appreciate today's shop hacks. Spray lubes and penetrating oils are a staple of any shop. But what happens when you're working with one 
in a hard to reach place. But what you can do is you basically take the straw, you cut it in half, and then you get some fuel line from any auto parts store or a lot of hardware stores. You cut it to a length, you take an awl and ream it out a little bit, and then you insert the hose into the fuel line. Now, the next time you have to reach a hard to reach spot in an engine cavity, you can do so with your flexible straw. Are you like me and always losing the straws that come with penetrating fluid or spray lube? Well, I've tried taping them on, as you can see, and that's cool for a while. But oftentimes what happens is the tape loses its grip and now you have lost the straw. What I did was create handy little straw holders. Basically, take the tape off, and I find these little office rubber bands. You can get them at any office supply store, and they work great. You can put one or two on, great for holding the straw. But if you want to create the ultimate super straw, you can do that with inner tubing, such as this from a bike or small tires. You slip it on over the can. You might have to stretch the inner tube a bit so they'll fit over the can. Now you've created a super secure hold and no more lost straws. We would love to hear about your shop shortcuts, tips, or make-dos. Send us your shop hack. If we use it on the show or in Successful Farming Magazine, we're gonna pay you a $200 reward. Send us a detailed description and images to the link below. I'll see you again next time on another shop hack. Join me as I visit Gary Ballard about his rare International 7488. Such snoopy nosed tractors are bringing record breaking prices on the marketplace these days. After these brief messages. Our Aegis Iron Feature Tractor this week is actually two tractors. It's the last of the International Harvester 2 Plus 2s that were built, the 7288, the 7488, both owned by Gary Ballard of Marshalltown, Iowa. And Gary, you came in these tractors to farm with. Correct. I mean, you didn't collect them. No, now, no. I farmed the majority of my farming career with, with these, these tractors. tractors. So Gary, did you ever expect that these tractors would be bringing the money they are now at auction because collectors are going crazy. Absolutely One is sold not. for 110, I think up to 120, 130 thousand dollars for these tractors. That that was this, both the 72 and the 74. Correct. Uh huh. Did you pay that much for you? Oh no, no. In fact, <laughs> in fact, actually, back when I bought my first uh, 7488, um, I was kind of trying. I I had no idea what what they was worth and right. that was back before anybody ever thought they was going to be you needed collectible. The I, I needed it for, as a farming tractor. Yeah. I never will forget I went to, uh, up to my local dealer and he says, boy, he says, I don't think any 2 plus 2 would be worth any more than $25,000 today. So your 7488 is rather unique because that's the hand-built prototype that's tractor correct. that they had in Hinsdale where they were testing. They, they built that tractor in Hinsdale. It actually came down the, the Rock Island line yeah. as a 5488, the back end of it did. And once uh, it got that part of it assembled, they shipped that out to Hinsdale and they they hand-built the rest of the tractor off from that. And that was a hand-built uh, 7488 that was actually built back in 1981, whereas the production run of these were actually in August of 1984. So that was hand built at, at Hinsdale. It spanned uh, 739 hours between Hinsdale and the test track at Arizona uh, being tested. And it was tested under different horsepower settings and everything because they had actually had plans to come with, with uh, bigger models of that tractor. And so after Hinsda Hinsdale and Arizona, then it ended up at the Nebraska test track. And that was gonna be the tractor that was gonna be rated under Nebraska uh, test conditions. And it was at Nebraska test track when the merger occurred of, occurred of K, K, uh, in 1984 yeah. when Tenneco bought International Harvester. The people left the Nebraska test track called the powers to be and said, what are we supposed to do with this tractor? And they said, scrap it. 
They said, we've got some still at the plant that we're, gonna, that we're scrapping, yeah. scrap it. So they signed off to a salvage yard up in Grand Meadow, Minnesota. But a guy grabbed it from there. Guy yeah, grabbed it from it there. Intact. Farmed with it to till the point when uh, his farming operation was changing and he was going more into confinement hogs and stuff and and had it for sale. And that's a, when I came across it. So I have to ask: Here you're sitting with some of the rarest tractors in the IH line. Are you still farming with them? I've got an 818s moldboard plow. Uh, and if I if I'm going to tear up something or if I'm trying to uh, redo a waterway or anything, I'll put the plow on the back of that 7488 and go play with it. And, and, and I, I also like and just tell the boys, it, leave me alone, I'm going to go out. I also like guys. taking it to shows and playing with it too. Oh, yeah. It's it's fun to plow with. Well, thanks for sharing the incredible history of these tractors. I'll see you again next week on another Aegis Iron Feature Tractor of the Week. Please join us next week for another outstanding show. Jesse Scott features our latest evaluation of UTVs on the Farm Test Team Report. And then I had to auction to feature one of the best values on late model machinery today, mid-sized tractors. And then I feature another great farm hack. This show shop innovation makes handling grease and oil a lot less messy. And the shark farmer Rob Sharkey joins us with his unique view of agriculture. See you next week right here on Successful Farming. Hi, I'm Dave Mowitz. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, hit subscribe right here if you haven't already, and click that little bell right here to be notified when we post a new video. And click here to see more great episodes from Successful Farming Television.